Folks, welcome to Paisa Paisa. I'm your host Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter. And coming up next, I talk with Shrihit Karkera, co-founder Ditto Insurance and Finshots. Yes, we last had him over on our show back in Feb 2020. Seems like hundreds of years ago for Finshots. And now he is back with Ditto. We are going to talk about a lot of things about insurance right after this short break. Hello, hello, hello. It's been another great week on the IBM Podcast Network. On The Wired Talks is our talks to former Secretary General P.D.T. Achari, who sheds light on words being banned from usage in Parliament. On Cock and Bull, Cyrus Ayushi, Akash and Antresh discuss the controversy surrounding Smriti Irani's family restaurant in Goa. On The Habit Coach, Ashton speaks about how a nursery rhyme can be surprisingly inspirational for adults. On Think Fast, Varun and Sujitha throw light on the rise in investments in plant-based meat. And on the Life Manifesto, Zarina helps you identify energy vampires and gives you tips on how to deal with them. Once again, everybody, remember we have amazing merchandise available. You can go to ibmpodcast.com slash store or go to our website and you'll be able to see the link. Do check this out. Do buy some stuff. It really does help us out. Do remember, follow us on social media. We're IBM Podcast on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Also, if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Remember, if you do tell a friend about a show and they listen to the show, you'll have somebody to talk to the show about. We'd really appreciate it also if you could give us a rating on whatever platform you're listening to us on. And finally, do remember we're also available on YouTube. A number of our shows are available as full video shows, but every show is available on YouTube. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, both Lifestyle, Small Case, Cap Gemini, and Intel V Pro. Thank you so much for making this possible. And welcome back. Hey, Shreyth, welcome back to Pesa Pesa. Great to have you back. It's more than two more than two years, man. Welcome back. Yeah, hey, Anubhav. I mean, it, like I said, it, it feels almost like a lifetime ago that we spoke <laughs> because so much has happened. And I think yeah. uh, if if we rewind our conversation back to the day, you'll see that I was I was saying so many different things that now I feel like it's a distant <laughs> memory, you know, even with respect yeah. to running the startup, etc. So, no, I'm, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to have had the opportunity to talk to you. And hopefully this will be a very productive session. Great, thanks. Let's get to it. Eh? You know, FinShots yeah. back in Feb 2020. Here we are, July, August 2022 to Ditto. What was the great yeah. idea? What's been the journey like? Talk to us about that. Yeah, I mean, look, I think when, when we spoke originally, FinShots was just sort of, I think, we would probably launched the product and we, we were about a few months in. Um, we were getting a few subscribers and I think it had done fairly well. We, we saw that it was getting a substantial traction uh, but then again, the 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 idea was always the same: uh, to use content uh, as a machine to then probably build a commerce layer on top. Uh, just to give you an example, the original thesis was that if we had a large enough subscriber base that implicitly trusts us, um, we would probably be then be able to build products uh, specifically meant for them, and then obviously, hopefully, uh, you know, build a business model out of it. Um, at the time, we thought we'd build a very complicated uh, financial advisory, sort of a robo-advisory thing. Um, and, and we had all the rails planned out. We had invested considerable time and money in building the channel, etc. But then obviously COVID happened. And I thought COVID was a, was, a, was a great reminder for us that, uh, uh, you know, I mean, especially dabbling in financial advisory at the time in March, April, um, it, was, it was almost a death knell. I, I don't think you could go there and uh, meaningfully say that you could probably make a dent in that department because people forget about finance. I think people were worried about their lives. I think it was very mm-hmm. difficult for them to even consider that a financial advisory solution was something that was going to be priority. So we quickly had to rejig things because in the financial advisory model, we wanted to do everything. We wanted to do mutual funds. We wanted to advise people on whether their home loan was, was, was probably a prudent option or not, et cetera, everything. And we wanted to do insurance as well. But I think when COVID happened, we quickly had to sort of realign and figure out what we wanted to do um, that, that could stay the test of time, stand the test of time. And we didn't want to be in a, an industry where the vagaries of, uh, you know, I mean, a virus, et cetera, would devastate us. So we thought perhaps insurance was one thing that could probably help us because at the time, people were becoming more aware about health, wellness, et cetera. And uh, so we we attempted it as sort of an experiment. Uh, We thought we'd probably set aside the financial advisory thing, focus on insurance, see if it works out. Uh, Luckily for us, it's worked out quite well. Uh, I mean, uh, I think 
um it, it it has been about a year now since we started selling insurance uh, more than a year and i i must say that it's it's been a very um rewarding journey for myself as well uh, just building the platform but also um for our customers because i think uh, um we've just been able to offer a new spin because insurance is generally missold and it's one of those products yeah, yeah. that nobody wants to buy etc uh, so i think I, i think overall you know the journey has been uh, has been nothing short of rewarding yeah Uh, good to hear that idea. so finshots is what you guys are half a mil right i mean you're 500000 subscribers yeah, yeah. now yeah we we have 500000 plus subscribers but i think with finshots the subscriber count is probably not a very appropriate metric to gauge sort of the readership etc because um once again you can read all of the content online without without even um seeing a, an intrusive pop up bar I mean, everything is available online um, and even the app if you wanted to download it you would have to scroll all the way down to the bottom the footer of the bar and then download it so most people uh, don't subscribe to the newsletter most people probably uh, listen to it on spotify amazon followers on linkedin instagram stuff like that uh, so while while our subscriber count is about 500000 i think uh, impression wise we do we do about 10 15x that figure right i mean simply because we have so many channels that we tap into um so yeah that's that's sort of been the base that that that's helped us uh, propel ditto as well uh, so most of our okay. customers coming to ditto etc from finshots so let's get into the problem at the industry level right what yeah. made you get into ditto and start the product um you know at an industry level what do you see the problems were and probably even at a user level let's let's go in depth into that once we're done mm. with that we'll talk about the specific product so let's start sure. with the industry level issues that you see right so i think one of the basic industry level this is you know since time immemorial if you are if you ask people what's what's the one thing that i do not want to buy and what's the one experience that i probably um had a, i mean a buying experience from purely buying experience point of view you'll see that people consistently rank insurance at the top uh, simply because the product is routinely missold um the product uh, i mean insurance salesmen have a have such a bad rep that i remember when 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 i sort of uh, would talk to my parents about building insurance products you know or, or at least a solution that would help people buy insurance uh, in a much more accessible manner routinely i think you know i'd get so- scoffed at because it's a profession that's seen as 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 not so i mean it's not what um upstanding folks do it, it's you know you, you it's almost like you have a, a snake oil smen sort of a thing but, but that's completely untrue you know i mean insurance is one of the most important financial products that you could have a pure protection product could probably save your entire finances just when things go south i mean when we saw during covid for instance i remember there were a lot of people they simply went bankrupt right because they couldn't pay their medical bills etc or they had a, a primary breadwinner unfortunately passed away it was horrible um, and so the problem at the industry level especially in the offline sector was obvious but then the online sector which was supposed to sort of alleviate some of the issues that the that the offline sector had originally you know because price discovery there was absolutely no way for you to compare prices like so policy bazaar etc did did a great job at sort of helping people um uh, compare prices policies etc but i think the rep never went away like even if you still ask people do you want to buy insurance and they say oh that's the worst thing that i want to do that, that's the last thing that i want to do because the spam calling this this little focus on advice more often than not it's about selling up selling cross selling sell all kinds of things i mean uh, savings products even though it may be suboptimal in nature right? i mean you have an investment product and insurance product club together so these were some of the issues that that were obvious to most people right but i think solving for it was going to be expect- exceptionally harder hard because think about it this way if there's a product that people don't want to buy and then you're saying okay i'm going to do it in a manner that sort of customer friendly customer centric which means you're not going to spam call you're going to treat customers with dignity you're not going to upset you're probably going to set more savings products aside i mean this is where most of the money comes from this is how you actually get people to buy insurance and so we had to figure out a way to actually build a product and do it in a way that's customer friendly no spam calling make sure that uh, you you offer the right advice to the right kind of people even if it means you have to take a hit on your revenue in the short term at least um, and and i think just just building together the product and making sure that people can come to trust you is perhaps the hardest challenge for us so so these are the, some of the things that i see on the industry wide level uh, mm. from a user perspective i think some of the challenges were i mean you, you could just just on a simple experiment on a problem just five people you meet and ask them if they if they have an insurance policy 
ask them who's the provider forget about the name of the policy just ask them who's the provider and i'm, I'm pretty sure the three people will come up with the names right and then you ask them what the name of the policy is and i'm pretty sure then four people will they probably one person who probably tell you what's the name of the policy and then you ask them can you please tell me what are some of the exclusions in your policy what does the insurance policy does not cover and you'll see a blank i mean you'll see blank faces you know come up immediately so from a customer point of view the biggest challenge was educating customers on what they're buying right so what we did was we said okay fine we're going to do a 30 minute conversation right we're not going to do the 5 minute sell you know almost like a sales pitchy conversation we're going to actually have our advisor walk through the nuance nuances of buying insurance for about 30 minutes and we're going to give them the time they need right maybe a week mm. maybe two weeks it's okay Uh, but we're going to solve for it that way. So, so these are some of the biggest problems that I see at least at the industry level for customers. Right? They simply don't have a clue about what they're buying and what they're getting into. Yeah, how about that, huh, folks? There's a, home, a quiz question for you for those who are listening. In a, name your insurance provider, and B, uh, name your policy. I can say about life, huh, Shreya. A medical claim <laughs> a little bit lost. I I know that my medical <laughs> my med my medical claim is from Bajaj Lines, but I. Right. I have no idea what the name of the yeah. policy. I think we've got a vague idea about what the exclusions yeah. are. But right. uh, good, yeah, okay, folks. We're going to take a small break out here. When we come back, we are going to talk about Ditto in detail, the product, what it offers, and stuff like that. And you know, for those of you who actually not checked out Finchot, just go ahead, you know, and just search it wherever on Google, and you'll get their newsletter. And Ditto is D I T T O, and I'm sure that you can check out what services they are they have to offer. On the other side of this break. we will walk you through exactly that the features of ditto the services of ditto and much more right after this short break hello 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 it's been another great week on the ibm podcast network on the wire talks with our talks to former secretary general pdt achari who sheds light on words being banned from usage in parliament on cock and bull cyrus ayushi akash and antresh discuss the controversy surrounding smriti irani's family restaurant in goa On the habit coach Ashton speaks about how a nursery rhyme can be surprisingly inspirational for adults. On Think Fast, Varun and Sujitha throw light on the rise in investments in plant-based meat and on the life manifesto Zarina helps you identify energy vampires and gives you tips on how to deal with them. Once again everybody remember we have amazing merchandise available you can go to ibmpodcast.com/store or go to our website and you'll be able to see the link do check this out do buy some stuff it really does help us out do remember follow us on social media we're ibm podcast on twitter facebook instagram and linkedin also if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter please do tell a friend remember if you do tell a friend about a show and they listen to the show you'll have somebody to talk to the show about We'd really appreciate it also if you could give us a rating on whatever platform you're listening to us on and finally do remember we're also available on YouTube a number of our shows are available as full video shows but every show is available on YouTube and finally we'd like to thank our sponsors this week both lifestyle small case cap gemini and intel v pro thank you so much for making this possible and welcome back chalo so, shayad okay let's talk about ditto and you know maybe do an eli5 or just walk us through what all do you offer right right so uh, like i said ditto is a an advisory first product and i know that that may come across as being a, a, a little bit dubious in, in some sense because it's insurance but i think what we initially said was you know the selling comes afterwards we're going to make sure that we offer the right advice to people and hopefully uh, the trust that we build will eventually get the customer to buy the product from us Uh, so in short you know ditto is primarily an advisory first product which means that you could either schedule a call with us so you could go to you know just google ditto insurance or just go to join ditto.in and you'll see that you could schedule a call at your convenience so we don't spam call you i mean you can offer you know you can just book a call at your convenience or if you if you if you want to talk to somebody asap right now you could just whatsapp us so there's a solution where you could just whatsapp your query and somebody will reach out to you and will solve your query so that's the first aspect of it so even if you're not planning on buying insurance even if you have no intention of buying insurance right you just want your policy reviewed you just want a second opinion um, you probably want to um, maybe you're making the first steps you know maybe the first steps before you buy insurance um, we we obviously facilitate all of that we help people understand the product better and obviously at the end of it if you feel like you know what i'm going to make a purchase 
we offer you all the comparison metrics we explain the nuances of buying insurance we set the expectations and i think that's one of the biggest things that we do uh, in making sure that you know just just to you know because we talked about medical claim policy and a lot of people don't are, are probably not well versed with the medical claim policy just sitting mm. together with the customer and making sure that they understand that there are such there is such a thing called as a specific illness waiting period there is such a thing called as a just and reasonable plus you know because insurance companies won't pay for everything you know, they they're going to ensure that the costs are in line with what's expected if you're availing treatment in let's say somewhere in bangalore right so it, just setting expectations so that the customers are not caught off guard when they eventually have to make a claim um, and once that's done obviously the customers have the provision to buy the product from ditto now Uh, you know the common misconception perhaps is that if if you're buying through a distributor right somebody somebody who's a middleman uh, then obviously you'll be paying substantially more uh, but once again that's hardly the case in fact most products that we sell uh, we sell it at a price that's that's the, you know the insurer will quote the same price right so we have mm-hmm. arrangements with the insurance company to make sure that the customers aren't fleeced per se um, so most products that we sell you see that there's the same price so so the customer doesn't matter whether they buy from you know uh, ditto or whether they go to hdfc or go directly um you know just as an example for an insurer and finally once the purchase is done once again we walk them through um the the application process so somebody will get on a call with you uh, they'll probably make sure that you fill in the application right because that's another thing uh, more often than what happens is you you apply apply for a policy you fill the proposal form you make a small mistake and what should have been a 3 day affair gets gets you know it becomes a 3 week affair so often times we we help them you know get through that as well and eventually after the purchase is done we tell them that if there's ever a point where they have to make a claim we'll obviously be there to help them as well uh, so your initial point of contact will be an advisor and once again not a salesman but an advisor who who will talk you through the nuances of the policy help you make the purchase and eventually also come to you at the time of claims um, so that's what happens and obviously we only dabble in up term insurance products and uh, health insurance we don't do savings products primarily because we believe that it's a largely a suboptimal option although you could make a case that there are some options that could be particularly viable for some segment of customers but we've stayed away mm-hmm. from that um, and we largely focus on health and term um, so that's what we do in summary so let's talk about your advisor right i mean i go to your website i book a free call you correct me to your advisor who is your advisor is he your you know is he an employee how well does he know yes. insurance and of course more right. importantly how how do i know that you know he will actually understand uh, my specific problem uh, that's a good question anup uh, you know uh, so all our advisors are our employees so every time an advisor so you know we make it a point to not hire people from the insurance industry So when we hire these people these are freshers or probably with a couple of years of experience looking to make a switch and then we obviously train them so we have a very elaborate training program that spans about 2 months um and we make sure that they understand the intricacies of insurance more often than not we only train them in one specific product which is you know, you, you could have an advisor who's specifically trained for term insurance leads or you know health insurance so so as to not to overburden them there's a multiple products there's you know even within the product there are so many sub clauses etc um, so that's what we do and once they obviously we vigorously make sure that they 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 could stand the test of scrutiny and if they can do that obviously they they go into the pipeline where they actually start advising people now who are these advisors in general i often times we get people actually you know calling you know after after the calls done we solicit feedback from these customers so they ask us um uh, you know what the experience was great right but I'm not quite sure how this is any different from you know the other aggregators etc and they have a very valid point because more often than not customers ask very simple questions I mean, what policy should i buy and then obviously even if the cost even if the conversation starts you know ends 30 minutes you probably won't be able to tell the difference because um there's there's not a lot of nuance there but mm. where our advisors truly shine is if you have a complicated case let's suppose somebody comes in and says you know what i'm i'm a freelancer right now um and i'm trying to buy a term insurance policy now that that's a much more complicated case because you don't have a consistent payout a salary payout you know or somebody says you know what i'm i've rheumatoid arthritis and my my mother has you know probably type 1 diabetes and i'm trying to buy a policy for both of us together what should i know what should i do and all of a sudden our advisors suddenly spring into action they tell you specifically what what companies will issue policies for rheumatoid arthritis they'll tell you what to look out for they tell you 
about some of the things that you should generally keep in mind when you're buying a policy for such specific cases. So usually what happens is that if it's a plain and simple case where you're just looking to buy a policy and you can't tell the difference. I mean, let's suppose I'm your advisor right now. I tell you something about specific illnesses and I tell you, oh, you know what, this disease is characterized as specific illness. And I tell you, oh, you know what, this, comp- this policy also offers you maternity benefits. Unless you actually go and dig in your policy and make mm-hmm. that assessment yourself, you're never going to be able to tell the difference. In fact, I remember we usually do an audit of different you know, providers, et cetera, to make sure that our, our advisors still do consistently better. And every time when we do an audit with a relative newbie, let's say we ask a customer, you know, we ask one of our friends to call these providers, they can hardly tell the difference when it's a simple case, as I said, because they don't know that more often than not, these, these questions, these complicated questions um, are being answered right or wrong. They have no clue. Right? But when it becomes mm-hmm. obvious is when you have a slightly more complicated case and all of a sudden advisors truly stand the test of scrutiny. And I, I invite anybody sort of probably listening to this podcast or even watching this um, to, to probably book a call and find it out for themselves. And it will become very obvious very quickly. So that's been our true USP. It's getting our advisors sort of, you know, up to the mark there. Yeah. Yeah. What about claims in the sense that do you guys yeah. help there also? I mean, do you, you know, do yes, you, yes. and I'm talking about health insurance, actually. I, yeah. what, I mean, let's talk about health and term both, actually, yeah. because yeah. both can get a little bit tricky on the claim side. So how do you guys help out yeah. there? Yeah, no, I think, I think, you know what, our, initially, I think we were very worried about this claims business because we were like, listen, I mean, the amount of bandwidth that we'd probably need to just, you know, have our advisors working on claims, etc. That was something that we were slightly worried about. But we quickly understood that it's an industry standard. Like you have to offer people claim support because they're trusting you. I mean, they bought the policy based on your advice. And then you're saying, oh, you know what, when it comes to claims, I'm, I'm going to sit back. Obviously, we were going to offer it nonetheless. But I think over the past year or, or so, we've had actually had about there were 50, 60, 70 claims or something like that. We've, we've dealt with as many claims. And uh, and I think we've, we've quickly recognized that it's perhaps not as difficult as many people thought. Because, see, one of the reasons why claims get challenging is because the customers aren't told to set the right expectations. Or maybe they've been oversold, you know, you know because every sales executive who's trying to pitch an insurance product will want to make sure that the sale is closed. So oftentimes they lie. They 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 probably um, don't accurately represent the truth, and in some cases deliberately hide facts as well, suppress it. Um, so we've quickly recognized that because most of our customers, once again, are well read and you know they follow fin shots, etc., and we set the expectations right. It's it's been smooth sailing. But in the event something does go wrong, I remember recently there was a case. A gentleman who was unfortunately hospitalized um, just after a month of buying the policy. And then they Mm. find out that he has diabetes, he has blood pressure, and unfortunately passed away because of cancer. Now, immediately alarm bells go ringing because insurance companies are saying, well, when he bought the policy, he didn't declare the fact that he had diabetes, PP or any of this. You know, there's, there's been no declaration. Suddenly one month later, all of this happens. And, and I remember it was a very complicated case because the doctors, his doctors, kept saying, kept insisting that all of these were found after he bought the policy, that, that he mm. had no condition. I mean, these conditions, he probably had them, but they only discovered it afterwards. And considering the fact that at the time of buying the policy, the customer made honest disclosures to the best of his knowledge, the insurance company was obligated to pay. Now, obviously, considering you know so many factors at play, there was some back and forth, but I remember just just intervening uh, at the time, and you know our advisor, I think his name is Ajay, um, immediately jumped into the action, spoke to HDFC, got the documents sorted, made sure that everything is pointed out right. Um, he knew specifically what to ask for, and yeah, we, we sorted that claim as well. So that's something that we do offer, but I think uh, we've come to recognize that that's hardly a challenge when you set the expectations right. But yeah, we we offer end to end claim support whenever somebody needs us, we'll be there for them. Oh, that's very interesting. So your website yeah. says that you've got more than what fifty thousand people who bought, uh, who sought Ditto's advice yeah, before advice. making their. I think it's about hundred plus now. Yeah, hundred plus. 100 fantastic. Plus, yeah. yeah. What, in your way, is the top three or the top five most repeated questions that you get? Oh yeah, I mean, I think the the first question is. I mean, the most obvious one is, you know, what policy to buy? And I wish there was just one answer. You know, I mean, if even it's health or term, I just wish I could tell people, you know what, this is the policy to buy. 
but then again that depends i mean somebody who's cancer will probably never get a policy more often than not their only option is to then probably uh, you know probably claim you know through group insurance policy maybe the sibling maybe the parent somebody um or 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 if somebody has a very specific use case and right? they want maternity they want international treatments etc you're not going to get the most famous you know most popular product you'll have to pay a premium if you want everything right so there is no one answer to that but i think in general there are a few things that i think people should look at and right? one is uh, not just claim settlement ratio because that's the obvious thing people look for but also the track record it's very easy to post a claim settlement ratio of 95% one year and then go back to 75 And so so because you know it doesn't matter when you're going to make a claim you have to make sure that the track record is consistent and the second mm-hmm. thing that you probably want to do is scale it's very easy to maintain a 90 plus claim settlement ratio when you're tending to probably a few hundred clients but trying to do it at a few lakh clients is a whole different ball game um so a f- few things like these will probably help you whittle down the possibilities with insurers but the specific policy will ultimately depend on what your needs are right so that's one of the first yeah. questions uh, the second question is obviously will my insurance policy cover everything no it doesn't cover everything in fact there is a checklist of options which is usually called as exclusions right and there are something called as permanent exclusions which insurance companies will never cover and there are some things called as i mean again with health you know, with term it's different with uh, with term i think it's it's mostly i mean if you die they're going to pay out right more often than not uh, and after 3 years of buying the policy insurance companies can't even go back and say oh you know what there was a material claim of non disclosure etc because the regulator mandates that the insurance company is obligated to pay whatever fact finding they have to do they have to do it within those 3 years so it becomes much easier with term insurance policies at least with health insurance is substantially more complicated there are more exclusions etc and there is a list of exclusions that you generally need to be aware of i'll name probably two or three so that your advisors will probably so your your readers will your listeners will probably be able to um you know glean once once if they are ever buying the policy um uh, one is insurance companies do not cover claims if you avail treatment in a blacklisted hospital this is something that most people don't know so there are a list of hospitals categorized as the blacklisted ones and uh, you if you avail treatment there you probably and, and if you want to find this again you have to go to the insurers website you'll probably find this information there uh, insurance companies don't cover what is usually called consumables which is your syringes your anything that doesn't have um you know that doesn't have a fixed mrp so if if it's yeah. a ppe kit because you could use as many as you want right um so uh, so yeah insurance companies generally don't pay it although you can attach add ons you could probably you know get the insurance company to cover it by paying slightly extra and finally insurance companies health insurance providers do not settle claims when there is ample evidence to suggest that the disease precipitated because of substance abuse it could be alcoholism it could be narcotics it could be anything so insurance companies mm. are not obligated to pay uh, so these are some of the things that probably insurance comp- so you are you know anybody who's buying insurance yeah, probably yeah. remember uh, but yeah that's 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 those are some of the top questions at least blacklisted hospital seriously i mean you know um <laughs> i of course god forbid god forbid god forbid if anything happens to you know listeners and all and i yeah lot of us have actually been through this you have a emergency you have a health situation you're not going to sit and you know you'll just go to the nearest hospital and you yes, find yes. out boom, I mean, it's blacklisted what what nonsense is that i mean i yeah. shouldn't call it nonsense i know that there's the insurance in industry has a process but you know what i'm talking about what's this yeah stuff? it's actually a good question so there are a bunch of hospitals that are what you would call as routine offenders so what they do is let's suppose you go in with an ailment right this stuff is so easy they're going to stuff, yeah they're, just they're going easy. to <laughs> inflate the cost so basically you've, you've gone in for a shoulder pain they've inflated the cost to about 2 lakhs just because they know that there's a cashless provider somewhere else right so when insurance companies find that there's a systematic abuse what they do is they blacklist that hospital and once they blacklist it effectively what happens is they market it and so now if you know that there's a hospital that's blacklisted you're never going to visit them so effectively it's a way of penalizing and sort of dissuading other providers from doing the same thing you could understand the insurer's logic here the only unfortunate bit however is that this part is not actively advertised to clients i was just going to ask that is is exactly. there a communication that goes out you know saying or do no. i get a whatsapp notification or a mail saying no. if you fall sick don't go to this hospital And sometimes they do i think yeah. when they yeah so when they blacklist new hospitals i think they usually circulate a message that tells you that oh you know what this hospital has now been blacklisted so please be aware but i yeah. think the general list and once again i don't think in, you know 
people should generally fear this because there are very few hospitals that way. I think uh, yeah, you find yeah. lot in Gujarat, etc. But I think in Bangalore, I think there's like one or two. I mean, as far as I remember, there are hundreds, thousands. You know, of hospitals here, and I, I, I'm yet to see consistent pattern of you know blacklisted hospitals cropping up. So it's very rare that it happens. But yeah. if it does, but happen, you know how it is. Right? You, you, you know exactly. that 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 out of. Hundred claims me as a user. I'll always remember that one time where this stuff exactly. didn't work for me. You know, so exactly. I, exactly. I, I think that's a, on. that's one of the things with insurance. You know, uh, it's like a fire extinguisher. It's nice to have at home, and if it bails when there's a fire, you're never going to forget the fire extinguisher, will you? <laughs> yeah. It's just psychology at work. Okay. Yeah. Say, how does this work, right? Because Everything is free for me. I'm not paying you. I'm not paying your yeah. advisor. And I can see yeah. from a website that you are an IRDAI, IRDI, you know, IRDI registered corporate agent. So, you know, agent. I'm just going to ask it bluntly from you. What exactly yeah. is your business model and how do you build that trust with me? I mean, I know yeah. that you've got this huge subscriber base on FinShorts. I'm sure about that. But what if, what if I'm someone who hasn't even heard of FinShorts and someone yeah. recommends Ditto to me. So, how do you build that trust, and what is your business model? Right. So, the business model is quite simple. We obviously don't charge for advice. The advice is free. But most people like our advice, so they eventually buy the policy through us. And when the purchase is made through Ditto, uh, we get to keep a small part of the commission. Now, that's how we usually make money. Now, obviously, the immediate question there is, even though you didn't ask it, I, I'll probably say it myself: yes. is what stops a Ditto from from probably recommending a policy that offers the company the highest commission now ideally that's the first question that i would have if i was sort of buying from ditto and mm -hmm. the simple answer is there's nothing actually i mean there's obviously abuse and there's obviously option for me to simply recommend a policy that pays me the highest commission however having said that i think considering we are an internet first business if i were to recommend you a policy that is subpar at best and you find that out let's say two months you know one month later your readers, your listeners right now will probably throw temper tantrums on Twitter and they'll probably harass us and they'll probably go. So there's an added disincentive for us to actually not do it simply because it doesn't, it simply doesn't work for us. So if we prioritize short-term interest over long-term income, effectively mm -hmm. what happens is we are doomed in the first one year because we are not the first movers in this space. You know, we, 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 have, we are coming after about 10 years of innovation in this space. And we are trying to probably add our own spin. And now we are trying to miss sell on top of it. There's absolutely no way to survive, especially if you're an internet only business, which we are mm -hmm. right now. So it doesn't make a lot of sense for us. And I think the question about trust, it becomes obvious when we deliberately tell people to buy products that doesn't optimize our income. For instance, I can give you an example. Oftentimes, when people are buying term insurance products, they want to buy till 90 you know, till the age of 90. They want to buy a policy and they want it to cover them till 90. Now, technically, this is a suboptimal option mainly because most likely you're going to die by 90 and insurance companies also know that you're going to die by 90, which means that they're going to extract a premium enough for them to make substantial money. So there's not going to be a winner that's, I mean, you're not going to be the winner in this equation because the insurance companies knows that you're probably going to pass away before the age of 90, which means the only way that you could probably come out of this equation slightly better off is if there's uncertainty. And that uncertainty only rests between 0 to 60, perhaps. You know, or 20, you know, if you're buying the policy at 25, 30, 30 to 60. Because there you can't tell much, right? Anything is possible. So there's an option for you to probably come out of this transaction better off. And generally also, people should buy a policy only till about 60, 65, because that's when they retire. They're not buying the policy to make money off of it. They're buying the policy so that their dependents have adequate protection. And yeah, routinely yeah. we get customers and we tell them, listen, buy till 65, you know, because it doesn't make a lot of sense. In fact, if you can buy a where, higher cover. Where does this come uh, from? Where is I, You're not the first guy telling me this. I've heard this a lot. Um, yeah. I've had, what is the deal? Why people? Why do people want insurance in the age of 85, 90? I mean, do they like it's, it, literally? I'm, I'm telling you, it's, it's one of the hardest things that we can do because people <laughs> just don't listen to us. Right? They just don't listen to us. They keep insisting on buying till 90. Like, I'm saving money for you, right? And oh, yeah, and they okay. still don't believe it, right? Because you know, you could you you could probably save at least. I mean, if you do an NPV also, you could probably save at least a lakh, a lakh or two lakhs in premiums, right? After you know, if you account for everything just mm -hmm. by committing to a smaller age and actually getting the product that you need. And so yeah. we routinely try and tell people that this is good enough. 
and yet people don't want to buy it. So I think that's one of the ways we try and establish trust where we yeah. recommend options that doesn't optimize for our income and it's obvious to people. Yeah, I, I think for people, you know, if there's anybody out there who's wondering that you still want to buy some product that takes you all the way to the age of 85, 90, 100, I don't know, Shay, what did you say? Annuity, pensions, you know, or just take a normal debt uh, fund and do an yeah, SWP? I mean, what yeah, you, I think what you look, tell generally my, my recommendation is to keep investments and insurance separate. Insurance should only be for protection. Uh, investments, you could probably try into government bonds, you could do FDs if you want that. I mean, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not going to suggest an option that sort of, you know, again, no, no, I mean, we're not doing recommendations. Equity, yeah, yeah. Yes. Not doing recommendations out here, folks, just to be clear about it. But I just, yeah. just saying that if you come to either Shayad or me saying that, listen, you know, guys, I actually do want something that's going to take me from 65 to the age of, I don't know, 100. There are other options. Please go yeah. on, Shayad. You were saying, sorry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. generally, I, I don't think you should you should protect your life after 65 simply because you won't have dependence at that point in time. And the only dependence that you will have, right, are probably, I mean, even if you consider your spouse, um, you should know that most people will have a retirement corpus at the time. It's it's unlikely that they will depend yeah. on an insurance product, right? For, Either, for protection. Yeah, if you specific re retirement corpus or maybe a provident exactly. fund or some right. pot of that's going fund to be there. There's always going to be there. And if you want income, then you should plan for income, not for protection. Like if you're saying, you know what, at the age of 65, I probably need more money until the age of 90. Then you should probably plan for that. Then that's, that's a financial decision. That's only going to optimize for your income investment. But if you're only looking for protection, if something happens to me, right? I mean, the best way to think about term insurance policy is very simple. I'm at the age of 29 right now. And I have my dependents. My parents are dependent on my income. And if I ever marry in the future, my spouse will also be dependent on my income, I hope, uh, to a certain degree at least. If that were to happen, and in my absence, I have to create a financial replica that will provide the same cash flows that I would have until the age of 60. So that's how I think about term insurance product. Because until 60, I would have provided for them. After 60, I probably wouldn't have provided for them. Right? Yeah. So that's the best way to think about term insurance because in your absence, that corpus should be enough to sustain all your dependents for the foreseeable future and not just for one or two years. In fact, I remember we had a case of a doctor unfortunately passed away very recently because of COVID, water term policy, etc., and I think he made the most appropriate decision. At the time, I remember there was a lot of back and forth with the insurance company because he didn't have, so, you know, it's dependent on your income, et cetera. And doctors make a lot of income after they turn 35, et cetera. But I think he was already fairly successful, but he had to show income proofs, et cetera. And we had to battle for him. Eventually, we got him a robust cover of about three crores, although his income probably was slightly on the higher side based on his income. And, you know, I mean, it's it's unfortunate that he lost his life, but at least the fact that his family will never have to think about money for the for the next 20, 30 years, you know, is probably the best thing that you could do. And I, I remember that's probably one case I, I even tell everyone, you know, my friends, etc. I'm like, if he hadn't made that one decision, it was very, you know, because of COVID, it was very quickly, I think it was about three or four months in after buying the policy. If he hadn't made that one decision, his life, I mean, his, his spouse's life, his kids' lives, been entirely different. It's a, it's an incredible decision, but yet it has such a gargantuan impact on, on everybody's lives. Um, so yeah, protection products only till about 60, 65, maybe 70. Uh, but if you're looking at investments, you should look at it separately. I don't think you should mix the two. Yeah, sorry to hear that. I mean, it's a tragic case and insurance usually deals it with is a lot of lot of tragic cases out there. But folks, there yeah. you go. You know, um, I think just keep that in mind, people. Just you know that there are specific financial products for specific needs don't kind of mix you know and um, and share insurance is a bit tricky right it's not like say a mutual fund where x advisor yeah. tells you to buy y mutual fund and y mutual fund does not perform and you can actually go and take that guy you know and probably figure out insurance is not like that right i mean you know yeah. you've got to get your advisor really needs to understand you so last question Shahid. let's get this down you know and we can probably do entire episodes on this question alone, and we have done so yeah. many in the past. Let's do checklists here. You know, let's just have a simple checklist um, on health and on term. And folks, again, disclaimer: obviously, not every point will apply to every person. Like Shayan has said repeatedly on this episode, that your policy needs to be very specific to your needs. Okay, so keeping that disclaimer in mind, Shayan, let's wrap this up. Here. You know, just yeah. some kind of a rough checklist: health, life. Right. Let's do health. 
Uh, so some of the basic features that you should look out for, one is, you know, capping on room rent. I mean, the last thing that you want to do is visit a hospital and then they tell you, oh, you know what? You can't stay in a room whose rent exceeds 5,000 or else you have to pay a lot more, not just the excess room rent, but in proportion to all the services rendered in your room. So it's very expensive. It gets very, very expensive. So make sure that you don't have a room limit on room rent. And even if you do, make sure that it at least offers you a single private room with AC so that you don't have to worry about that. You also want to make sure that the pre and post hospitalization expenses period, and sometimes, you know, people will only offer you 30 and 60 days, but if you want excessive protection, you want to make sure that it will be 60 and 90 days, which means two months before hospitalization and probably three months post hospitalization that will offer you, you know, enough protection. If you want, you could do it up to six months as well. You have policies that offer you uh, no co-payment. Um, now, the reason why I say this is very simple, more often than not, it doesn't make a lot of financial sense. So perhaps it's best if you keep the co-payment aside. You'll have many policies without co-payment. You could buy those products. Um, you also want to make sure that your insurance company offers you at least the opportunity to do a free health checkup. Recently, I got my insurer to pay at least three or 4,000 on my medical test, which were completely paid by the insurance company. It was completely cashless just because I wanted to perform a few diagnostic tests, right? A few tests, um, my vitamin D, et cetera. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, that's something that you probably want to do. Um, and the final thing that you want to probably want to consider is some of the metrics that I earlier spoke about. I talked about claim settlement ratio, but there's also another ratio called as the incurred claims ratio. Now, a lot of people don't look at this. What it means is if I'm collecting, uh, say, 100 rupees in premiums, how much am I paying out? Right? So if I'm mm. collecting 100 rupees and I'm paying 94 rupees, it means I'm paying most of my money out. It's good. But if it crosses the 100 barrier, it means I'm not financially sustainable as well. If it's less than 50, like, say, for example, I'm paying out 50 rupees while collecting 100 rupees, it could probably mean that. I'm not paying out the big value claims. Maybe my claim mm -hmm. settlement ratio is very high, but if there's a five, six lakh claim, probably I'm skimping on it, right? So I think that's another thing. A good number is between 70 to 80%. If your ICR is between that, it's a good number to take. And also the claim track settlement track record. Generally, you want to see the, the claim settlement ratio, but you also want to make sure that the, 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 the settlement record is also pretty stellar. These are some of the basic checklists, especially if you're looking to buy a health plan. But if you're looking mm -hmm. to buy a, a term insurance plan, I think most Chet, one of minute. It, just yeah. hold yeah. hold the life insurance just for two seconds. I, I want to just no come problem. in here and talk about cashless. What is the deal ah, out there? Because yes. you know, how do I know that I'm getting into a hospital? You know, when you know when this is happening to me, I'm not in the frame of mind to figure out cashless, yeah. not cashless. Um, yeah. I'm wheeling somebody in, and I go to the billing department, and they say you got to pay a one lakh deposit. Boom. Yes. I'm not going to sit and haggle with that guy out there because my attention is somewhere else. Talk to us about this cashless thing. How does it work and you know so, what any tips out here? Yeah, I think I think one of the tips that you know most likely you look the easiest way to optimize for the cashless uh, facility is to look at what is called a network hospital, right? So generally what insurance providers will tell you is that if I have you know 100 hospitals within my network domain, you can claim your, you know, you can make your claim on a cashless basis in these facilities. You know, if you're drawing a very simple analysis, you could say higher the network hospital, better the chances of you getting a cashless claim, right? However, there's a slight flaw in that logic. Like, for instance, I think HDFC Ergo right now boasts the biggest, you know, uh, uh, you know I think uh, the largest hospital network. But if you specifically wanted to know what, like, you know, I, I remember, especially I come from Mangalore. So, HDFC or go may have a massive hospital network outside, but my debate now is if I was staying in Mangalore, I want to see if they have a good network in Mangalore. It's entirely possible that most of their network hospitals are concentrated in the north or somewhere in the east mm -hmm. or somewhere mm -hmm. outside Mangalore, and they don't have as many hospitals in Mangalore. So the one thing that I would tell people is don't just look at the network hospitals in its entirety. Don't just say, oh, 14,000 network hospitals, great. And make sure that you go to the insurance provider's website and you'll see a network hospital locator. So go to your PIN code, enter your PIN code and check if there are a list of hospitals that these are the hospitals that you usually frequent. And so yeah. that would be yeah. a much better gauge than simply looking at a headline number. And obviously, I would much recommend that people do a cashless procedure as opposed to reimbursement because honestly, reimbursement is still, uh, I mean, they tell you that they're probably going to settle it in 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 30 minutes, in one day, in two days. But my experience, it never, ever happens. So I think cashless yeah, is the way to go.
this is shit honestly you know you know this as well as i do yeah. when you're in that emergency it's just what yeah, you yeah. do first and us mein hua i mean you know yeah. if it happens it happens if it doesn't happen then anyway um yeah and it's a tricky point that's why i just thought we'll spend some time on it yes. life insurance let's talk about that yeah so so once again if, if you're looking at term insurance look the products are very very simple right um, you die you know the insurance company pays it out you know pays the money out to your to your dependents right? that's to your nominees that's that's how it works uh however if you wanted to optimize the choice obviously you have to look at what are usually the big numbers the claim settlement ratio etc but you'll see that there's not a lot of difference there also because once again there's not a lot of debate on whether you died or not i mean once you die you know people are and the insurance company is obligated to pay out it's not as if there's a lot of scope for confusion here which means then you're looking at things like okay what's my optimum cover right okay how do i look at that well in general again my understanding is that your income so your your term insurance product should be a financial replica which means that in my absence i should have a product that will generate let's suppose it gives me a large lump sum money of say 3 crores right now if i were to chuck that 3 crores in uh, in a bank and you know, do fixed deposit that 5% you know interest that i get whatever 5 5.5% 5%, uh, that including the principal the interest and in the principal should offer me the same cash flows that i would have generated through my income my dependent mm-hmm. should get the same kind of money until the age of 60 65 etc so that's the way to think about it and usually um, it's probably somewhere in the range of 15 to 20 x right so that's the first thing the second thing is please do not buy money back products a lot of people will buy a term insurance product and then they'll want their premiums back i mean the simple there's a simple answer to this an insurance company if they know that they have to pay your premiums back they will extract enough from you in premiums only it's not as if they're going to do a charity project and just give you money back they're going to take that money from you they're probably going to make some money off of that and then they'll return what what's remaining so it never almost makes sense to buy a financial product where you get money back especially if it's a term insurance product because you're not going to win from this arrangement and the final thing that i would probably recommend people is to buy an insurance term insurance product not until the age of 90 i mean something that we've spoke of and and there's something else a, a debate about limited pay and regular pay you know I, i'm not quite sure if your if your uh, uh, listeners would probably know about this but basically what the way it works with term insurance is you could pay till the age of 60 65 until you hold the policy your premiums or you could say i'm going to pay all my premiums in 5 years 10 years now if you do the math right and you know usually when insurance companies tell you that listen you can prepay you can pay in 5 or 10 years they'll offer you a discount but even if you take into account that discount you'll see that that sum right is probably not going to compensate i mean if you were to do the npv the the net present value calculation mm-hmm. you'll see that the discount won't compensate for the additional you'll you'll be paying more right if you prepay it however there is also a case to be made that a lot of our customers i remember can't name him but he's very very famous let's say a financial advisor online um so he was buying an insurance product for for his parents and he was buying it for himself as well a term insurance product mm-hmm. and he wanted to do a limited pay he wanted to pay in 5 or 10 years i don't remember precisely what it was and i told him i mean you would know better than me that it doesn't make financial sense the calculations don't work out and he said yeah, yeah i know the calculations don't work out but i just want to buy the product and pre pre pay it because i don't want to think about death i don't want to think about term this product okay <laughs> so so i'm whatever like, sales is bought eh? what whatever sales is bought I, I, exactly so a lot of people come to us saying ki listen i just want to prepay it because i don't want to worry about making these payments in the future etc i want to do something etc and we say all right but it doesn't make a lot of financial sense especially if you're only talking about the money right okay we were the prepay and and you wouldn't believe a lot of people even after we offer the advice we show them the calculations still by limited pay and i wouldn't fault them also because i've seen people like i said in this case right he just doesn't want to think about that and I'm, who am i to say that oh you have to you have to buy it before right? i mean i'm not going to sort of sit there and debate with him um so so yeah i mean i think that's one thing that uh, just saying you know if you yeah. want to do that you probably just put a corpus aside where the return on that corpus <laughs> pays your premium and you're sorted and you just do an yeah, auto pay yeah. right i mean you set up an auto debit and you literally don't have to think you about could, it for the rest of your yeah uh, you, you could probably do question. that <laughs> yeah. yeah no I, i'm 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 just saying you know but then again i understand where he's coming from death very yeah. touchy topic and who like you said yeah. who am i to judge yeah whatever yeah exactly so just yeah. just one thing shay the cover is a function of my income right so it's like if yes. i let's say that my salary is 10 lakhs right 
um the 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 insurance people will give me a specific cover that's related to that i can't or can i yeah. ask for a 10 crore cover even though i have a 10 lakh no. salary i mean you said 15 no, to 20 no, lakh how does yeah that's what no no you 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 can't ask for a 10 lakh you're not going to get a 10 crore cover because i mean it's a moral hazard problem i mean look there must be no perverse incentive for you to kill yourself either um yeah, I so I, i know i know it's sort of uh, No, I'm just saying because Sorry you said the 15 to no, no, that's fine. You 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 said the 15 to 20 times, which is fine. You know, I'm I'm just saying that let's say that I have an annual income of 10 lakhs. Let's say that you know yeah. I probably um theoretically that would be saying that I need a cover of one crore, and if I get 10 percent FD interest, then I'm sorted, right? But 10 percent yeah. is on the higher side, so whatever. Yeah. So yeah. what's the way to look at this? Yeah, I mean, so so look, it depends on your salary. Like, for instance, in some cases, we can intervene on the. Uh, just to give you an example, let's suppose somebody who has a you know uh, a degree from a tier one institute, right? Who's likely to earn a lot more money in the long run. I mean, they they probably now have a you know uh, you know because they're just joining the workforce, they probably have a small salary. Um, it's possible that their salary will expand considerably over the years. so we could pitch in and say you know what 2025x is probably slightly low you could can you can you can you go up to 30x yeah, i mean yeah. th- we can push it a bit but once again i think usually it's very hard to do it because insurance companies are very skeptical about such things um i think the moment somebody says i want a higher cover they're immediately going why <laughs> Like why? And then, why do you want to hire them? They've they've got this list of industries also where if you're working in those industries, you might not. Yeah. You know, yeah. They think that that's risky. Yeah, is yeah, that, yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Is, I mean, is yeah, that still a thing? Yeah, it's still a thing. Uh, there are certain <laughs> uh, people that I mean, again, it's 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 very specific, which is why I said the only way to know is this. You know, all these things is to actually go through the cases and specifically talk about these. And different providers treat them differently as well. So we know. you know certain insurance companies who absolutely did not touch doctors at the time you know during covid and there was a massive issue surrounding it etc and then we had insurance companies who who were willing to insure them but at a at a certain modest rate right i mean they're not go, they're not excessively going and say go oh, while god offer them the 5 5 crore cover or something like that this this still sort of modest but but yeah we we have things like that and very specific to individual cases and more often than not I think this is one place where distributors actually help. So somebody like us, for instance, we could go back to Max and plead the case. Right? More often, our customers mm-hmm. don't have the kind of leverage. But if we say, you know what, um, we already do a lot of, you know, we we already transact with you considerably, right? I mean, we we work with you a lot. How about you make an exception for this case? And probably they will listen sometimes, right? So so oftentimes we can extend our own leverage, probably put our own weight down and say, okay, fine, maybe we could. Still, a little bit, uh, but yeah, that, it's very specific to individual cases. And shorts companies still have, um, you know, their own underwriting guidelines. Yeah, one last and final question because God knows that this yeah. is, you know, it's, it's stuff that we can go on talking about. Yeah. What is what are the options for a homemaker? Zero income, but the entire right. house so, literally so, depends on her. Go on, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, Anupam. Yeah, no, I I got a bit excited there. Uh, simply because uh, uh, it's a topic um, I feel very strongly yeah. about. I remember that I tweeted yes, about it once, yes. and then I got you know I got I I won't use the word cancelled, but you know educated that <laughs> hey listen insurance is X Y Z and it's not about I was like okay whatever please go on sorry it's a topic on which even I have some views please go on yeah no I I I you know until now I don't think we had many providers who would insure homemakers. But just recently, once again, I think it's because people like us keep batting for them, right? I mean, I remember again, we work very closely with Max Life, for instance, and we've been batting for it excessively. Uh, I'm not saying that's why they did it, but they probably did it because of their own consideration. But recently, they came out with a few guidelines saying they will probably start insuring homemakers as well. Um, I think that's something that's on the works. I'm not quite sure if 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 it's it's going to happen asap or if it's already happened but this is something that was in the pipeline so insurance companies are now coming out and saying you know what we need to stand out as well we need to probably yeah. do something that's probably slightly different from what the from what other providers have been doing once again there are some caveats there i, I mean I'm, i'm still not privy to the entire details uh, fine, but yeah. but but yes i mean it's it is happening it's a discussion that's actively happening in insurance domain and i think uh, people are now coming out and saying they will they will insure individuals even homemakers for that matter which again reminds me about the what's it called mwp the manage protection act that whole thing about you know ensure that you have that clause in your life insurance policy what it's recent it's just 4 5 years old what's that about uh i'm not quite sure about that i think it was something that sort of uh, 
uh, that happened quite recently. And specifically, once again, there are some caveats there as well. I wish I could probably talk to you more about it. Uh, but uh, I haven't been dabbling with, with term insurance right. products for a while now. Um, so I'm probably not That's be able okay. to That's offer okay. you a very comprehensive view on that. That's yeah. okay. Folks, just, you know, just call your insurance provider, call your, you know, friendly neighborhood insurance advisor and speak about this. But I think, man, we can just go on. You know, I think, uh, yeah. I always feel Pesa Pesa should have like an insurance special because God knows it's a product that all of us yeah. need. I don't think the coverage is really that big in India, right? I mean, we've got about what, one? Oh, no, it's, it's, it's some, pretty poor. I... At... Yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, go on, Anupam, sorry, yeah. No, no, I, I'm I'm just saying I'm glad that the government has taken some steps in the last whatever five ten years about ensuring the ones who actually need it, which is the really poor people, and giving them you know the the uh, the I think it's a prime minister's scheme there for health insurance and for life insurance. God knows those are the guys who actually need it. But other than that, what are the numbers like? Shay? Go on, sorry. Yeah, no, the numbers are pretty poor. I think it's sub five percent. Uh, but then again, that that I think that's that's a bit misleading also because. Once again, I'm not quite sure what that includes because there, there's a lot of, um, you know, especially with the government policies, you know, if, if you consider them, there's some degree of protection there as well. Um, yeah. But I think there are multiple numbers being bandied about, but it's it's really not that great as far as I understand at least. Um, a, I think Irdai, especially the, the, you know, the new head of the regulator, um, I think he's been pushing incessantly to make sure that um, we ensure everybody by, I think it's 2048, if I'm not wrong. Um, I think, you know, we achieve 100% coverage. And I think he's 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 been very proactive. I recently attended a, a, a sort of a conclave where we spoke about these things and where he was very passionate about insuring individuals as well. Yes, yeah, so I think he's been pushing insurance companies and, you know, aggregators, distributors like us as well. Um, so hopefully that number will increase soon enough. But you're right. I think it's it's primarily the people, you know, the underprivileged, etc., especially with the lower income groups that need significant protection. But even, you know, within the middle income group, I mean, I know so many people who probably just one paycheck away or, or one hospital trip away from, from dropping back to the poverty line. I and mean, that's that's how precarious the situation yeah, yeah. is, you know, a bill of five or six lakh would completely decimate a household. Um, yeah. so, so in some sense... It's it's pretty bad, you know. The, the coverage situation is pretty bad. Hopefully, we can we can sort of take baby steps on improving that. Um, so yeah, I mean, hopefully. Yeah, and you know, it also falls on people like us to educate everybody that yes. you know, you know, who to actually do this and probably even help them. I've done episodes with uh, a pension tech company called Pinbox and how they are right. enabling pension for uh, the informal labor and stuff like that. So folks, if you're listening in, you know, you maybe want to have a conversation with, if you're a boss, with your employees, if you're someone who has domestic help and just, you know, just, just have a conversation because these last two years have been miserable, very difficult for a lot of people. And God knows that, yeah. you know, that health insurance can actually take you through um those tough times and of course and life insurance as well but shay thanks a lot i think this was yeah it's gone on for almost an hour but you know what it is with insurance yeah uh, but yeah. folks uh that is a wrap on this episode of pesa pesa my guest my returning guest you know he's back here after two years Shahid Karkera, co-founder Ditto Insurance and Finchots. Shahid, I wish you guys all the best. You know, I hope that you get you, um, you. Your, your entire Finchot database translates into Ditto Insurance. I think you guys are doing a good job. I wish you guys all the best and thank you so much, man. Thank you for doing this for our listeners. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. And listeners, thank you for listening to this episode of Pesa Vesa. If you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IBM Network. You can listen to us on the IBM Podcast app or ibmpodcast.com. You can also follow us on our social media. We are IBM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And if you want to reach out to me, I'm your host, Anupam Gupta, B50 on Twitter. And folks, thank you, really. Thank you so much for listening to Pesa Vesa.